one of the things you've undoubtedly noticed is we're starting to have more and more women as we had in the, you know, in the 18th century, there were more than in the 17th century. And in the 19th century, there were even more women. Uh, in the 20th century, of course, there were even more women artists, especially as you get later in the century. Um, so, you know, there's only so much time. Uh, so one of the things I'm having to do is sort of pick and choose uh, and uh, sometimes I feel really guilty <laughs> leaving people out, um, but I guess we could call the selected women artists of the 20th century. We're going to start in Germany uh, with uh, an artist called, uh, her name is uh, Paula Modison hyphen Becker. Um, she married uh, Otto Modison. And uh, so, so as you can see, um, her dates, 1877 to 1907, just take her slightly into the 20th century, uh, but that's when most of her work is. So she is historically a very important German artist. She can be considered either a precursor to German Expressionism, uh, because there's not really an art movement of German Expressionism, or she's the first German Expressionist. She is the first German artist to use uh, post-impressionist ideas and style. She's the first German artist to use what we could call modernism. Uh, she's the first German artist uh, to essentially to be a modern artist, uh, to use modern ideas and modern style uh, in her work. Now, one of the things um, that a lot of times people who you know, don't know the history of, of art or the history of artists do, is they will see abstract work. And sometimes they'll say, oh, that's because the artist can't draw or can't reproduce. Uh, of course, there's a lot of false assumptions with that idea. Uh, one of them is that art must reproduce the visible world, which, of course, uh, it's some periods of time, that's what art wanted to do, or an idealized version. but. One of the hallmarks of modernism is the idea that art does not have to reproduce the visible world, uh, that there are other ideas and other considerations that inform art, and it's not just about uh, your skill of reproduction or imitation. However, you have to understand that all of these artists who are turning to a more abstract style, who are turning to what we now call modernism, who are creating modernism, all of them started off with very traditional training. I can't say that that's true for everybody today, but most of them were creating art that was um, very realistic. They you know, studied from the model. Um, at this point, women are now just beginning, in some cases, to be able to uh, study from a, a nude female model, as you can see here uh, with Modus and Becker's uh, drawing of a woman sitting on a stool, uh, which is a, right at the end of the 19th century. Um, and I wanted to show this before I showed you uh, her, the other works that she's better known for, just to indicate that yes, she had the traditional training. Yes, she could reproduce <laughs> the visible world uh, you know, to the nth degree. Uh, she can do realistic work. But that's not what she chooses to do. And because of her choices, she becomes an artist. We used to use the word progressive a lot. I guess it's uh, uh, now not a word that, that people use as much. But she's doing art that's new, that's more modern. Uh, by choice. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about her life, her short life. She died when she was 31. Um, and she died from the aftermath of childbirth. Uh, she had a heart attack or an embolism uh, that uh, killed her probably because of the strain of childbirth. So she's uh, like La Tintoretta, like, Yaka, uh, like um, Marietta Robusti. She's another woman whose career is cut short uh, by the dangers of childbirth where she dies uh, because of that. Um, she wants to be an artist, but her parents 
are not quite sure about this. After all, they want to protect their daughter. They want to make sure she has a way of supporting herself. And art is, as everyone knows, a very chancy uh, profession. So the parents say, all right, you know, we will support your art. We'll send you to uh, the Berlin School of Art for Women if first you get a, uh, a profession that you can fall back on. Uh, and so she had to train as a governess, which is some, the, about the only profession uh, that was available for a single woman. Uh, and uh, you know, it wasn't at all what she wanted to do, uh, but that was the bargain. So she, you know, she, she never worked as a governess, uh, but she trained as a governess. Then her family let her go to the Berlin School of Art for Women, where she created uh, this realistic image of the woman sitting on the stool. She moved to a uh, artist colony in northern Germany. It was. Uh, the, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, I don't know. The Verbsveda, Verbsveda Artist Colony. Um, she visited it, and then uh, the following year, in 1898, she moved there. Now, this was an artist colony that had ideas about uh, living out in the rural area, getting away from the city, um, and uh, they, most of the people there were painting uh, bucolic, picturesque, villages and landscapes and the peasants from a very picturesque point of view. Uh, she didn't do that. Uh, as you can see here with her picture of the old peasant woman. And you can see here, she later uh, makes a comment about her husband, her, this will be her future husband, uh, but her husband's uh, style, which is indicative of what most of the artists were doing. And she said, his way of portraying people is not broad enough. It's too genre-like for me. If it is possible, one should draw them in runic script. Runic script? What does she mean? Well, I think the art kind of shows us. Incidentally, the reason we have all these quotations from her is she kept a diary. So we're seeing here one of the uh, images of a woman that she used several times as a model. Uh, there was a village poorhouse, and uh, this was a, a peasant woman who was, I believe she was also a dwarf. Um, and she was attracted to the fact that you, her, her forms, her shapes, were these simplified uh, forms. And so she creates with these kind of, even you know, in a smaller image, it could be a monumental form, monumental simplified forms. The surface of the painting is very, very thick painting. Uh, it's an impasto texture. And the colors are quite striking. Uh, the woman is it, it's wearing a bright blue garment uh, with a uh, bright green background. And uh, some of the images that I took, they, the uh, garment may look a bit dark because uh, that's been the characteristic of what has happened when I'm taking film images and then we're um, in whatever ambient light there is in the museum and then we try to change them into digital images. And I'm not much of a photographer, but uh, I think you can see with the details uh, at least some of the fact that you're picking up these very, very uh, deep, uh, thick layers of, of paint. Her style was totally different. It was totally unique from the other artists in the, in the artist community. Uh, most of the Verbsverda artists were painting, as we said, picturesque details. They were painting nature and landscape and folk culture. She often painted the same subjects, as we saw. She, she painted the old peasant woman. Uh, sometimes she paints landscapes. Uh, but her style is quite different. Um, she's painting with expressive color rather than color that just imitates whatever is in nature. She has color that um, you know, suggests emotion, um, that uh, goes further than what the, the local color is. Uh, it's often laid out as though it were flat, and uh, the depth is sometimes just in the, the thickness of the paint. Um, she strives for and this is where we're talking about this runic script of her painting. She strives for a primitive or crude appearance. Uh, 
and she's interested in the artistic expression, not in simply imitating uh, a scene in nature, which not very much anybody can do, has been done, has been done, has been done. Uh, she she's, has a, a different vision of art, if you will. Here we're looking at two landscapes, and I tried to find very similar subjects. Uh, one is Paula, Paula Modis and Becker's uh, landscape, and the other is by Otto Modison. And his landscape, you know, it's, it's more traditional. Uh, with hers, she's simplifying the shapes. Uh, she's getting close. She's not really showing a vista. Uh, you know, she's not really interested in picturesque little details, uh, but big, bold shapes. And uh, here we see another landscape by her, which is land landscape with house, birch trees, and moon. And this dates from 1904 to 5. And as you can see, it's not at all the kind of uh, thing you would expect from a landscape. You see the, the two trees, and instead of framing uh, uh, your vista with the foliage, you just see those sort of um, stark shapes of the birch trees. Uh, and then nothing is uh, what, uh, centralized. You're not looking directly at the house. It's off to one side. Uh, so it's almost a study. If you stop thinking about these as objects uh, and just as uh, flat shapes, you essentially can see them as something besides the image of a tree, a house. Uh, this is her portrait of uh, Rilke. Uh, Rilke, of course, is a very famous German poet. He was a member of the Verbsverde uh, community, and uh, his wife was a sculptor there. Um, however, when he wrote his monograph on Verbsverde, he did not mention any women members. Now, is that because he just assumed that because they were women, they weren't serious artists? Women, of course, could not be serious artists. Or um, was it because the women members were doing something different? <laughs> uh, they weren't just um, involved with the uh, picturesque, rural uh, ideas, that they were actually doing something much more unique than the male members. And uh, he wanted to talk about uh, the, the concept behind uh, the community. Uh, we'll never know. You know, we can't come back and ask him. Um, but I will say one thing: after Paula Modis and Becker died, he wrote one of his poems, which was called "A Requiem to a Friend." It's a very long poem uh, in her honor, and they were good friends and they corresponded. So the fact that she's left out of his monograph just seems very, very odd. Um, as we said, she had a, wrote, left a diary, so we have uh, these quotations. And one of the things that she says is almost uh, the opposite of what the, the artistic community that she's living in seems to believe. She says, there's no need to be concerned with nature in painting. The color should exactly reflect something you have felt in nature. But personal feeling is the main theme. Now, that almost sounds like something like um, Van Gogh or any of the modern artists. So Fauvism hasn't, doesn't even exist yet. Uh, Matisse's Fauve painting of the joy of life uh, is painted in 1906. So it's very interesting that she's moving in the, the same direction. And uh, she's seeing that art is something more than imitation. She did have two exhibits in her life. And the first one was an exhibit in the Brennan Kunst, uh, Kunsthalle. And um, all the work that we've looked at um, you know, had not been created yet. But uh, even at that time, when she's you know, showing her first work, uh, the curator is, well, the, the verb that my source used was attacked. I'm softening it to criticized. Uh, but the curator was criticized because he had exhibited three unknown women. I'm not sure the emphasis should be on unknown, because aren't curators supposed to find new artists? Or, more likely, the emphasis maybe is on women. Uh, you shouldn't be showing the works of women artists. Um, so she still had that hurdle uh, to overcome. She went to Paris four different times. 
um, and they were between 1900 and uh, 1907. And I was trying to find the exact years, and I think it was um, 1902. Well, maybe I'm going to say because I'm not quite sure. Um, at any rate, um, this just drew her. She could take art classes there. Uh, she enrolled, uh, in fact, at the same um, uh, the same school that uh, Clodel was in, and uh, she took classes several places. Um, of course, this was after Clodel was was gone, but uh, you know, it's the the one that would allow women in, uh, Colorosi. Uh, and I think she also so took some classes at the Ecole de Beaux Arts, which uh, previously had not let women in. So that's kind of interesting. I found that reference and no explanation. Um, she visited the Louvre and uh, presumably saw and perhaps drew uh, from the Louvre. And she also went to the gallery that was showing the newest, most modern work, which would be Vollard's Gallery. Um, Vollard is a famous art dealer because he is the art dealer uh, that first exhibited the post-impressionists and the early modernists. So everyone, you know, says on Picasso, Van Gogh, you know, all of these people. Um, and so this is where she saw Cezanne's paintings. And so I'm showing you here two of Cezanne's works, uh, The House of the Hanged Man, which was, uh, you know, much earlier than this, uh, 1874, and uh, a still life with apples. Perhaps I should have shown you some of his later work. Um, and so here she's painting some still lifes. And as you can see, simplified forms, strong, powerful forms, um, emphasis on the different shapes as geometric forms, and, you know, undoubtedly some influence, uh, perhaps, from uh, Cezanne, but she was already working in that direction. So here, before she's probably ever seen Cezanne, and then uh, you know, continues with the uh, more expressive uh, works that she's doing. Now, her parents hadn't forgotten that she was supposed to be able to support herself. She was supposed to have a career for unmarried women. Um, you know, they, they humored her, her with this art stuff, I guess. Um, and they started to put on pressure for her to, you know, get a real job, uh, to go out and become a governess, uh, because that was the only thing that an unmarried woman could do. And, and she wasn't supporting herself with her art. Um, so basically, you know, the woman who hadn't made a financial success of the artistic career had the two choices. She could become a governess uh, if her parents were no longer willing to support her, or she could get married. So in 1901, she married Otto Modison. Now, Otto Modison was an older man. He was a widower. He had a young daughter. Um, he was probably looking for a wife who would take care of the daughter. Um, but one of the things he did do is he did respect her art. They were very different kinds of painters, but he gave her space. Um, some people would have said, well, he indulged his wife too much. You know, he should have made her much more subservient. Um, but that was very important. Um, on the other hand, it was certainly no great love affair. I'm sure she was fond of him. But she's not happy in her marriage. And her diary tells us that in my first year of marriage, I cried a lot. I lived as lonely as in my childhood. It is my experience that marriage does not make one happy. Marriage takes away the illusion that previously bore on one's entire life, that there is a soulmate. So, um, Essentially, I suppose she's, she's been disillusioned uh, that uh, there is some kind of romantic soulmate. Um, and, you know, it is, as I said, it's, um, it's a working marriage in it, it part just because her, her husband is willing to give her uh, some space. But she's not very happy in her marriage. 
And um, here I found a photograph on the web of her, uh, which you can compare to one of her s several self-portraits. She paints herself a number of times, um, and uh, basically simplifying the forms. As we say, she painted a self-portrait a number of times, and one of her best-known works is the self-portrait with the amber necklace. Uh, there seem to be two versions of this, uh, both in Brenham, uh, one in the art, uh, the art museum there, the Kunsthalle, and the other in a private collection. And I put them up together so you can sort of compare them yourself. Uh, she's still, she's of course using these bold, simplified forms. Uh, the background, which is the, the um, plant forms, uh, are uh, simplified shapes that form a pattern as the background to the bolder, more monumental, simplified shapes of the form. Um, it's kind of interesting because she's holding a little flower, so dainty, and yet the body itself um, has that you know, broad, uh, sort of primitive uh, feeling. Um, the face is, is very simplified. Uh, and what's, I, one thing I want to say is I don't suppose she knew about this, but uh, I don't know, I haven't found any references. We think of African masks, we think of uh, in 1907, uh, the next year after this, uh, Picasso cr creates uh, the Demoiselles de Avignon, and uh, they talk about uh, the fact that he's influenced by primitivism. Well, Paulus and Modipson Becker was actually doing that slightly before he ever did it, uh, and she was doing it uh, perhaps not with the same influences, uh, but there is a kind of structured mask-like quality about her face. That amber necklace appears in a number of her works. And uh, it, you know, it forms obviously a decorative form. Um, here's another work, um, the self-portrait on her sixth wedding anniversary. And this is painted in 1906. Now, one of the things about Paula Modus and Becker is we said her husband gave her a little space. He knew she needed to go off to Paris and see what was modern and what was going on um, and to work there. And at this point they are separated. She's in Paris. He's still back in, in um, Verbsvetta. What's really interesting about this is that if the date is right, and no one seems to argue the date, uh, she looks pregnant. She's emphasizing her pregnancy. But if you figure out the dates, her daughter was born on November 2nd, 1907. So she couldn't have been pregnant in 1906. Or she couldn't have been pregnant with the daughter that was born then. And there's no record of a miscarriage. Um, so that becomes very interesting. Uh, she's showing herself, you know, with that same amber necklace. Uh, the body is is uh, turned a three-quarter view. She's showing more of the body, uh, and her hands are on both sides of the stomach, which definitely seems to be pregnant. Now, what is going on? Is she showing herself? Uh, pregnant because she hopes to be pregnant? Well, there's a big a problem there with her life. Her husband definitely wants to have uh, more children. She is not so sanguine about that. Uh, a few months before she paints this, she writes that she really does not want to have a child. Um, whether, you know, whatever the reason it may be. Um, so is she pregnant with art? Do we want to interpret this symbolically? Is she looking at herself uh, like what she may become if she follows her husband's wish? Is she showing herself pregnant because that's what a woman is supposed to be? You know, is she exploring uh, who is she? Is she, you know, what she is always told to be? Or, you know, is she finding herself uh, in uh, her her artistic endeavors and her trips to Paris. Well, she does return to her husband early in uh, 1907, and she does become pregnant. Um, before, the, uh, before then, she does paint a mother and child, and uh, she also has some images of uh, children. 
So that is certainly one of the subjects that she, she paints. Um, the reclining mother and child that you see here uh, is that's also talked about the very solid, primitive forms, uh, simplified shapes. You know, certainly nothing prettified about it at all. Um, the birth of her daughter takes place in November, uh, and she has a very difficult childbirth. Um, she dies three weeks later of some kind of heart condition or an embolism is what, um, I have one book that said heart attack, and um, I said websites tend to say embolism, uh, something related to her heart. Um, and that, of course, cuts short, cuts off her career. One of the things that's interesting is that her daughter rose up to create a foundation uh, in, in honor of her mother. So um, her legacy, of course, continues. Uh, one other thing uh, that's kind of interesting about her art, uh, even though it wasn't very well known outside of Germany for, for quite a while, um, Hitler included her work among, among the forbidden artists. You know, uh, he, didn't, he didn't like modernism at all. And uh, so she was well enough known for, she's long dead, but for, uh, 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 I guess it's kind of an honor to have Hitler denounce your work of art. Uh, and then, of course, as the interest in women artists um, comes, to the, you know, comes into being, um, of course, there's much more interest in her art. Uh, but she is phenomenally important, uh, standing really at the front of uh, the German Impressionist, excuse me, standing in front of the German Expressionist. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the people who begins modern art in Germany.